If you weren't here two weeks ago for the first part of this class, um, it was recorded. Where it is, I don't know. We'll deal with that another day. Okay, but the first part was essentially mainly shifting your mindset on working with buyers. Okay, sometimes we, we have this whole negative connotation on working with buyers and they can be very difficult. But if you have a negative thought going into it, then it's going to be even more difficult. So we talked a lot about that on... Um, two weeks ago. So now let's talk about what to do when you get a lead. Okay. What to do when you get a lead. So you get a buyer lead, a couple things I wrote down here. And I think we actually ended on this, but I'm going to just repeat it again. You have to do a buyer's consultation. If you don't have a buyer's consultation uh, questionnaire or something like that, let me know. I'm more than happy to share one with you. But the consultation has to be extremely thorough. Your goal is to be so thorough with the consultation that there's only like five listings to show them. Now, all jokes aside, you might say, gosh, there's not even five listings to show them without a consultation. But the reality is most buyers do this. Uh, yeah, I'm looking, I'm qualified up to 650. I'm looking for, I don't know, anywhere, Covina, West Covina, La Puente, El Monte, Walnut, Diamond Bar, you know, anywhere in this general area and at least three bedrooms and two bathrooms. Well, if I go to the MLS and I search all those cities up to 650, three bedrooms and two bathrooms, I'm going to end up with 50 active listings. I don't want to show 50 properties. So the consultation is to get that down to five. All decision makers must be present. Okay, all decision must be present. And the only way you'll find out who the decision makers are is if you do what? Ask. Ask. Thank you. A buyer Don't, overthink it. Don't overthink it. <laughs> Just ask. Who are the decision makers in this? Don't assume that, well, they're married. Of course, it's just the two of them. Oh, no. Okay. Could there be a parent involved? Could there be a financial advisor involved? An accountant? Could there be a friend, someone else who's involved in this, a brother? I mean, we've all, if you've never been through this, you will. I've certainly been through it both in my career and also in coaching. That is, well, I, yes, I wouldn't show the buyer the property, but you know, they had to think about it because they had to talk to their dad about it because their dad's helping them with the down payments. Like, oh, right. Or yeah, I wouldn't show the dad the property. He didn't like it. Or I wouldn't show the girlfriend and they didn't like it. All decision makers have to be present. Ask who the decision makers are. Okay. <clears throat> now, one thing you can try to do as a little idea is once they're pre-approved, ask the lender, are they, because let's say they go, no, I'm, um, I'm getting the loan on my own. So I'm the, I'm the decision maker. Ask the lender, is anyone else co-signing on it? Or are they getting a gift? Because the lender might say, well, yeah, no, they're getting a, a gift from their parents. You can go back to the buyer and say, hey, are your parents going to be involved in the decision-making process since they're going to have some financial obligation in this decision? Hello. So make sure you, can, you ask the lender. They might be able to answer some of those questions for you. All right. Set the expectation on the market up front. We role-played that this morning at 9.30, okay, of the expectations of the process. Get them to sign a buyer broker agreement. Treat the buyer broker agreement the same way you would the listing contract. When you go through the listing presentation and they agree, what do you say at the end of the listing presentation? All we need to do now is simply sign the contract so I can help you get what you want in the time that you want. Won't that be great? Sign the contract. It's the same thing for a buyer. I never understood why we complicate this so much. We say it at the end of a listing and then at the end of a buyer consultation, we go, okay, great. And then that's it. At the end of a buyer consultation, you go, great. Well, all we need to do now is simply sign this contract so I can help you get what you want in the time that you want. Won't that be great? Great, sign the contract. And instead of a listing, you give them a buyer broker agreement. It's the same script. Don't overthink it. But just like you can't get them to sign a listing agreement if you don't give a great presentation, you can't get them to sign a buyer broker agreement if you don't do a great presentation, which is part of the consultation. Okay, get them to sign a buyer broker agreement. 
And I wrote down here, set a date to go see properties before the meeting is over. So you meet with them, you do the consultation, don't end the consultation with, okay, well, let me go look up some properties and I'll call you back and we can set up the date to go see. Because now you have to follow up and they might not answer, they might not be available, set a date. Okay, great, well, look, I'm gonna find some properties. How about Friday at two o'clock? Is that available for you to go see properties? Yeah, great. So now you have a day to go show property, which is Friday at two o'clock. They've committed to it. So now it's in the schedule. If for some reason there's no showings available Friday at two, then you call them and reschedule. But get a date in mind already before the meeting's over to go see property. Okay. This is even more important if they have not been pre-approved yet, because then they'll rush to get their stuff to the lender. Okay, great. Well, because now they're excited. They do the consultation. They've, they've narrowed out their dream home. You've gone through all the steps. It's like, okay, great. Well, I can't wait to go show you some property. How about Friday at two o'clock? Yeah, Friday at two is great. Okay, well, before I do that, though, I just need your pre-approval letter, letter by Thursday. No problem. Because now they're excited. And now they'll go get the stuff to the lender. All right? All right. Very good. Good stuff. So as we move on from there, only show two to three properties at a time. Only show two to three properties at a time. Max. Why a max of two to three properties? Why not six? You get them confused. Get them confused. Yep. Get them confused. Well, because let's think about it this way. You do this for a living. Okay. You do real estate for a living. If we went out right now, Maricela says they forget what they've seen. Yeah. If we went out right now and we went and saw six properties. And at the end, I looked at you and I said, okay, great. How would you compare property one versus property six? Do you think you could really give a detailed explanation of property one versus property six? Probably not. You could probably, you, you would know the basics, right? And especially if you wrote stuff down, but you do it for a living. Now let's pretend that all your money's on the line, your stress level's high, your anxiety level's high. And now I ask you, hey, of the six properties you've seen, which one would you like to write an offer on? Well, I don't remember the first three. So really it was just a waste of time, the first three. Okay, so two to three properties max. They can retain that. As Chris said, they won't get confused. Okay, they'll, they'll, that's easier for them to understand. If at all possible, show two to three, not one. Now, if they're in an, a remote area and they're looking for something specific and there's really only one, Okay, like they're looking to buy in what was the area the other day? It was in, I think it was Tustin or some one of those areas where there was, in a certain price point, there was only two active listings. You know, if they're in something like that and there's only one available, then show one, but try to show them two to three because you have to make the most of your time, right? You have to make the most of your time. But I wrote down here don't show properties that are kind of like what they want. Chris says, do you recommend previewing the property first before showing or is it a bad use of time? I, I would do worst case scenario, at least a virtual preview. And here's why. So this is a great question, Chris asked. Do you recommend previewing the property beforehand or is it a bad use of time? You have to at least do a virtual preview, if not a real preview. Here's why. What if they say, look, it, we're, we're open to this. But we, this is the example we always use, but we really don't want the power lines over our house in the backyard. We just, we really don't want that. <clears throat> okay, great. You look on the MLS, you look at the photos and the photos only show the great bathroom, the kitchen and all this other stuff. It fits the square footage and you say, great, let's go. And then you drive up and the very first thing they notice because they're big is power lines right over the house. And they look at you and they say, I, I said only one thing I did not want is power lines over the house. Then you're screwed and you've lost that deal. 
So you need to do either previewing or a virtual preview where you can do the Google Street View, the satellite view, so you can see what potentially is going on in that area. It's a great question, Chris. Thank you for asking. Okay. <clears throat> Very good stuff. Because the truth is, they're never going to take a picture of the bad stuff. Right? I want a house that's turnkey ready. I don't want to do any remodeling. And you go online. This happened to me. It's a true story. We were purchasing a house a few years ago. And I went, and it was an area that I wasn't familiar with. So I, I didn't go preview homes. It was, it was an area I didn't live there. I didn't know the area. So I was like, oh, let me just go online and, and take a look at some properties. I felt, felt, I felt guilty of not doing what I preach in this particular example. And I saw the lines and they had this up, they had these upgraded bathrooms. And that was the photos. I was like, wow, these bathrooms look really good. Okay, cool. So upgraded. I, they didn't have a lot of photos. I was like, well, I wish they had more photos, but the bathrooms look great. So we go see the, we go see this house. And the only thing that was upgraded in the entire house were bathrooms. The rest of the house was a mess. Kitchen, there was holes in the wall. There was like dirty carpet in the living room. And the rest of the house was like a total mess. And we walk in here like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> like you totally tricked us by just only posting pictures of the upgraded bathrooms and the rest of the house is a mess. So if, as, if I was working with an agent and I had said, hey, look, I want a house that's turnkey ready. I don't want to do any upgrades. And they had shown me that house. I would have looked at them and been like, what the hell? So yes, you have to know some of these things beforehand, okay? So don't show properties that are kind of like what they want. Figure out what they want and show them their properties, okay? Very rarely, but let me ask you this. Is it likely that a buyer is going to pay $20,000, $50,000 above list price for something they kind of like? No. No. So don't show them something they kind of like. <laughs> if there's nothing available that they like, tell them there's nothing available of what you're looking for. So we have a couple options. We either need to A, go to a different city or a different neighborhood within the city, or B, we have to eliminate some of the things that you have on your checklist. But don't just say, well, I know you wanted three bedrooms, two bathrooms and 1800 square feet. This one's two and two and 1400, but it's in the right neighborhood. Don't do that. Okay. Right. Don't show homes that are kind of like theirs. Now here's a, a Mike Ferry line, an objection handler. They say, well, I want to see more. I want to see five, six, seven, eight homes, right? This is Mike Ferry objection handler. If I show you eight to 10 homes at a time, either I don't know what I'm doing or I didn't listen to you when you were telling me what you wanted to buy. That's the Mike Ferry objection handler. If they, if they're persistent, on seeing more than number of homes, okay? I wrote down here next, you cannot use distance as a reason for showing more than three properties. You cannot use distance as a reason for showing more than three properties. What I mean by that is you saying, well, I'm not driving an hour and only showing two properties. I'm gonna show six, seven, eight properties. Refer it out. You can't use distance to justify that. I've seen that on coaching calls. Well, I have a client that wants to buy in Palm Springs and, you know, I just want to help them out. You know, so we're going to go out there. Uh, I've got like seven or eight properties. I'm going to show them. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? You can't use distance as a reason to show more than three homes. Refer it out. I wrote here next, when you're showing the property, plan the route to the home carefully. Plan a route that, that could ignite some emotion that could help them make a decision. Plan the route you take to the home carefully. Plan a route that could ignite some emotion that could help them make a decision. Meaning that if, if the house is, okay, well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna hop on the, uh, the 57 and we're gonna get off on Imperial, make a left, and then the, the house is right there. 
all they're seeing is the 57 freeway, which typically is not like a glorious scenic route. So take them past the mall, take them past the parks, take them past the theaters, the gyms, take them past the schools on their way to the house. So they're visualizing the area that they're living in. As opposed to just get off, get on the 57, get off on Imperial. You could ignite four to five buying emotions before you get to the house because they're already planning it. Oh, wow. Okay. So there's the school that, you know, Cambry is going to go to. Okay, perfect. Oh, there's a, there's the theater. We love going to the movies. Perfect. Wow. Look at all these restaurants that are pretty close by. Plan the route accordingly. If they're with you, or maybe if they're just following you, try to park across the street from the house you're showing, because then they get to see the house as a whole as they're walking up to it. Because when you park in the front of the house, it's almost like sitting in the front row of the theater. You're just kind of getting this. You park across the street, I got the whole panoramic view, I see all the house. Now that could be good or bad, okay? but let them get the whole thing. I wrote down here next, find out what they want most in the house, show them that first and last. Find out what they want most in the house, show them that first and last. They're excited to see it, so show it right away. Then they'll buy into the rest of the house and then you wanna leave on a high note, so show it to them again. So give me an example. You say, hey, what are you most excited about seeing in the house? Well, you know what? We're big into, you know, cooking. We, we subscribe to HelloFresh or whatever those companies are that send those boxes of food. We do all these recipes. We love, you know, really nice big kitchen. Fantastic. As soon as you get in the house, you open the door. Hey, look, before we go check out anything, let's go to that kitchen. You walk them straight to the kitchen. They see it. Now, they're, okay, we're looking at this house. Now you show the kitchen, they're here. They're at a 10. Oh my God, we love it. This is exactly what we're looking for. Now they have the, the goggles on, right? Right, where everything's wonderful. So now you go to the living room, they're on such a high. It's like, okay, yeah, there's a living room, but they're still, they're still on the high from that kitchen. You show them the bedrooms, you show them all these other different things. They go through the rest of the house and you say, hey, before we go, let's go take a look at that kitchen again because I know it's important to you. You go to the kitchen. Now, again, they're at a high again and you leave the house. And they're on that high. Now, if they're on a really big high, is it going to be easier or harder to get them to write an aggressive offer? Easier. easier. Right. That's what we're trying to accomplish. Doesn't make a lot of sense to show the garage last, you know, unless that's what they're into. But yet I've been at showings and this is what they'll do. This is this, this is this. And then right before they exit the house, they go, they do one of these. Oh, and here's the garage. And then they close the door. Great. So I saw a bunch of junk and boxes and kids toys that are 45 years old. That's how I'm leaving the house. Now, if the garage is what they're into, well, we, you know, I, we got cars and I'm a, I'm a Tim Allen, Tim, the tool man, Taylor, right? For those of you that remember him, rah, 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 you know, I want the garage and I want, you know, this and that. Okay. Well, let's go there. Let me show you this garage. But other than that, you know, we show the garage last with that kind of lean into the door. Oh, here's the garage. Find out what they want the most, show them that first and last. All right. And then as you're showing the property, this is Mike Ferry, Mike Ferry rules of showing property. Keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, shut up and watch for buying signals. Keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, shut up and watch for buying signals. If you just pay attention and stay quiet, the buyer will tell you everything you need to know about the property. 
Because what are they doing as they're walking around the house? If someone's, if a buyer's walking around the house, what are they doing? Imagining their self in it. Yeah, Think, right. Thinking and out loud. Thinking, yes, there it is. Both of you, right. They're imagining themselves in it and they're thinking out loud. So they're walking around the house going, oh, wow, look at this. Okay, so this living room. Okay, well, I could put this here. You know, I yeah, like that. Oh, wow, look at this kitchen. They're thinking out loud. All you have to do is listen. It's like, okay. They, they, they clearly like the kitchen. They like the living room. Oh, you know, God, this bedroom's kind of small. I don't think I could fit a king size bed in here. I might have to fit down to a queen. And you're just sitting there going, God, could they fit a queen in here? Could they fit a king in here? Could they fit a queen? And you're just listening to the types of things that they're saying. They will answer all of your questions instead of just saying, okay, well, look, you know, walk around. Let me know if you have any questions. Listen, because if you don't listen at the end, what happens is you go, great. what do you think? And they're like, oh, yeah, it was okay. What well, do you want to write an offer? I don't know. And you don't know why. Because you weren't listening to all the thinking out loud that they were doing. Keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, shut up and watch your buying signals. <clears throat> all right, next. You, you do a max of two showings without them writing a full, at least a full price offer on one property before you have a reevaluation conversation. Max of two showings without them submitting at least one full price offer without you having a reevaluation conversation. So here's what I mean. You show properties. They're not really into the properties you show them. Okay, you try to figure out what it is that they didn't like about the properties. Okay, you do a buyer box in, a buyer box in. What a buyer box in is this, you show them the property and you say, great, so would you like to write up an offer? And they say, no, no, I don't think we wanna write up an offer on this one. Okay, great. What didn't you like about the property? Yeah, I just think the bedrooms are too small. Okay, great. Other than the bedrooms, are there any other issues? No, other than just the bedrooms, great. So if I found you a house just like this, but with bigger bedrooms, would you write an aggressive offer? Yeah, I would. Okay, great. So I do a buyer box in and then I go show them those properties. And then if they still don't write an offer, because now it's two showings, I need to have a reevaluation conversation. And a reevaluation conversation is not angry. It's not irritable. It's simply asking questions to figure out, are they really motivated to buy and what's the problem? I just tell them, Robert, that we need to have a come to Jesus meeting. There you go. Perfect. Come to Jesus meeting. <laughs> there it is. That's it. That's it. Harmon's got it. Come to Jesus meeting. Right? Otherwise, what you don't want to have happen is, well, you don't want to write an offer? Okay, no problem. And let you go show them again. You want to write an offer? No. Okay. And then you just find some more properties, go show them again, you show them again, you show them again, you show them again. And you just keep showing until one day, hopefully this works out. Two showings and then a reevaluation conversation. Because either A, they're not being honest about their motivation, or B, we're missing something. We, we haven't asked enough questions. We're, we haven't taken the right notes. We're missing something questions. that's going to get them moving. Okay, so don't just keep showing and showing and showing. Two showings, then figure that out. Okay. Now, here's the thing, though. You have to understand. Well, let me ask you this. Buyers look for properties online, but do buyers go actually preview properties inside the house? Some do. Some do, but most don't, right? They look at right. properties online. Do most buy, how often do people typically buy homes? Is it every year? Every five years? Five Usually seven. longer, right? Five. Yeah, five years, you know, 10 years. So my point is, they don't know what's out there the way you do. So they have a right to say, this is what I want, and then go see it and go, you know what? This isn't what I want. I want three bedrooms, two bathrooms, up to you know around 1,800 square feet, 6,000 square foot lot. And you show them that and they go there and they go, gosh, I've got four boys 
that are all 6'5", 250 plus. You know what? I thought 1,800 square feet was going to be big enough, but it's not. I thought 1,800 square feet was going to be bigger. They have a right to do that because they're not seeing homes every day. They're not buying homes all the time. So they might not know square footage, layouts, all these other different things. So that's why you give them a second opportunity. But don't get mad and go, gosh, you told me three bedrooms, two bathrooms, 1,800 square feet. Now you want this. They don't know. They don't do this for a living. Imagine if the roles were reversed. Well, what do you do for a living, sir? Oh, I'm an aerospace engineer. And then you try to go figure that out in one day. <laughs> Imagine them getting upset. Well, I told you. <laughs> one day. Can't believe you need two days to do this. Okay. But you give them a second opportunity. You figure out what they want. You go from there. Okay. Robert, I have a question about open houses. Yes. Okay. Um, it just saved your buyers... What, what, should, what should you advise or tell your buyers if they're not 100% ready yet to go look at a house, but they want to, you know, go off to open houses unknown and look at, at, you know, property and stuff like that without yours? It's not a bad idea to let them go like that. What, what's your thoughts? Well, I would ask them, okay, great. Well, I know you said you're not really that motivated, but you want to go see homes. So tell me a little bit about that. What are you hoping to see at these open houses? What are you looking for? You know, are you like to get looking? ideas and stuff? Yeah. Like you set them off to go look open houses, get sure. idea of area, neighborhood and things like well, that. Well, I want to figure out, first of all, um, I want to figure out, first of all, why they're trying. Are they just blowing me off or are they just looky loose? Well, you know, we're not ready, Robert, but, you know, we, we want to go see some open houses this weekend. OK, great. Well, let me ask you, you know, what are you hoping to accomplish at the open house? Is there something if you saw something at an open house? Is there anything you could see at an open house that would make you want to buy the house? Well, maybe. Okay, well, let's talk about that. And I would dive deeper. What, what is it? You know, because maybe I, can, maybe I can get you to the right open house. Maybe I can get you to the right property. So I, I would ask that question because I want to try to figure out if they're just blowing me off or if, they're, if they really are just looking loose. Now, if I ask that question, I say, not really. We just kind of want to see what's going on in the marketplace. Now I'd say, okay, good. Then I would just let them go. And I, but what I would do is say, okay, great. Well, look, let me know if you have any questions. And uh, after you go see the open houses, let me know which properties you went to go see and what you thought of them. And, and, yeah. I, would let, and, I, and I would let them go. I, I would just let them go. Yeah, now, obviously I, I there's, agree. there's the possibility that they could really be searching for homes. And they're going to go to the open house and they might go talk to the listing agent and all that stuff. That's obviously a possibility. Can I chime in? Yes, Fred. Uh, one of the things I would suggest, and I've done this for years, is I would say, all right, so when you go to each and every open house, every listing agent is going to have a series of questions for you. Or whoever's at the host or a host at the open house is going to stop and talk to you. Yeah, you don't and they're going to consume 20 minutes <laughs> and you might be lucky to get through two houses in an afternoon. So I'm going to give you some of my cards. And the first thing you do when you walk in the door is you say, I have an agent. Is it OK if we go through? Because <laughs> now you save all that time, Mr. Byer. You don't have to talk to every but they'll leave you alone. You have carte blanche and you can go through the house on your own. And yeah. if they ask who's your agent, you give them my card or you give them my number and you have them give me a call That's and I'll talk to them. Yeah, that's right. That's why you don't get your client get poached either. <laughs> yeah, because every agent's going to talk to them to try. They're there for a reason. They're trying to get a prospect. Yeah. yeah. So you can eliminate that by great just line. having that conversation. It's a great line. It's a great line. Good. But yeah, I, I would let them go. I, I would let them go. But but I would want to, again, just make sure I'm asking questions before they go, just to make sure I'm not missing something. You know, and, and that's that's my key. All right. Good. Good, 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 good. That's a great point, Fred Broad. Hey, thank you. Yep, no, good question. Good question, good question. All right, very good. So that's the process of showing them property and then getting them to write up offers. And what I would say to you is this, you, have, you cannot be afraid to ask them to write up an offer and you cannot do that with a weak tone of voice. 
So what I mean by that is after they see the property, you have to say, great. Now, based now, now that we've seen these properties, which one would you like to write up an offer on? You can't say you it's it's okay to ask that question and not just be like, all right, well, look, let me know what you think. And um, if you want to do anything, let me know. I don't, I hate to tell this to some of you. Some of you are going to be very upset, but I'm just going to be honest with you. You are a salesperson. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I get it. Robert, I don't want to be that salesperson. Well, you're in sales. And one day I'm going to write a book. And that book is going to be called, If You Don't Want to Sound Salesy, You Shouldn't Be in Sales. <laughs> okay? Sales is asking people to buy a product. So same thing with a buyer, okay? You're not forcing them to buy anything. You're not being rude about it. You're not being mean about it. But at, in sales, and any sales is asking someone to buy a product. As a listing agent, you're asking them to buy the product. The product is you to help them sell their home. In helping the buyers, the product is the house. You're asking them to buy the product. So confidently say, great, based on that, which of these homes would you like to write up an offer on? Not, well, you know, would you like to write up an offer on one? But I mean, it's only if you want to. I don't want you to feel pressure or feel forced or anything. I'm not pressuring anybody. I'm just asking which one they'd like to buy. It's okay to do that. And then it's also okay for them to say, I don't want to buy any of them. You do that all the time. Anytime you go to a store, are you interested in this? No, I'm good. Thank you. Telemarketer comes, you're interested in this? No, I'm good. I mean, you know, I mean, you do it all the time, but people ask you to buy. Okay. So ask them to buy. Which one would you want to buy? And do it confidently. If you have no confidence in them purchasing that property, they have no confidence in buying that property. They're looking to you for guidance. You're the market expert. So if you can't confidently ask them to buy a property, they're looking at you going, gosh, they don't have any confidence in me buying this property. Well, why the heck, why, why would I do it? I'm, a, I'm on a high stress level, it's all my money. Very good. Very good. All right. And last couple points here as we're wrapping up. A couple things uh, just to kind of end on. So some objection handling. Do you ever have a buyer that says they want to look in multiple cities? Okay, great. What I don't want you to do is show homes in multiple cities. So here's what you do. You ask the question. They say that I'm looking to buy in Irvine, Costa Mesa, and Anaheim, okay? Here's the question, great. If all those cities had the exact same house for the exact same price, which one would you write an offer on? And they say Irvine, great. Now I've established that Irvine is their number one city. So instead of searching in Irvine, Costa Mesa, and Anaheim, let me go find out if, I, if they have what they want in Irvine. And if they don't have anything in Irvine, I'll ask, great, which city would you write up an offer on second? Costa Mesa. Okay, let me go to Costa Mesa. But if you don't do that, what happens is that you search and then you find the house in Anaheim and you go show them in Anaheim and it's a great house. But what's in their mind? God, I really wanted Irvine. Okay. It's one way to get around that particular thing. So you would just show them that only homes in that number one choice first until you've exhausted that. You don't yep. yeah. go to number 100%. two. 100%. As long as it fit what they were looking for. Now, if they're looking for a particular thing in Irvine and it's like what they want at their price point, I can't find an Irvine, then don't even bother with it. Go to the next area. Okay. but I want to go to the first city first. 
or their main city first and help them find a property there instead of searching all around. Okay, figure that part out. Robert, um, it's me, Eddie. Yes, Eddie. <clears throat> hey, so let's say a buyer tells you, oh, you know, I really like the property, but I want to wait to see if something better comes up. How would you handle that? Uh, what would be, okay, it's great. Oh, I completely understand. So let me ask you, what would be better? And then they're going to give me an answer. Well, you know, just something, you know, that maybe is bigger. Okay. So if this property is at 550 and a better property comes up, do you think that property is also going to be 550 or do you think it's going to be higher? Well, it's going to be higher. Great. Do you have the extra money to make up the difference? No. Okay. That's how I would handle that. Hey, so it's just about, hold on one second, Ayanna. And it's just, and it's just a matter of just walking them through that process. I want to see if something else comes up that's better. Yeah, we get that all the time. But, you know, the reality, if we're just thinking logically, okay, well, first of all, what would be better? Because maybe it's not something better. Maybe they just have an issue with that property. What, what is better to you? What, what would you be looking for? Well, I'm looking for, God, I just really want something with bigger bedrooms. Okay. Great. So if I found a property that had everything else similar, but bigger bedrooms, would you write up an aggressive offer? Yeah. Maybe I can find something that's a little bit, just got a bigger bedroom. But if they say, well, I want something that just, gosh, I mean, you know, I really want a pool. Okay. So if I found you the same house with a pool, do you think it's going to be the same price? Well, no. Okay. So, you know, that's how I would try to handle that. But figure out what they're what what they want that's better first. The the reality is to that point, and I I'll get to your question. This brings up a great point. Eddie brings up a really great point. Okay, we talk about this with the lack of inventory. Let's say that somebody is looking for a seven hundred thousand dollar house in Covina, and there's ten homes available right now. If five more homes come available, are they all pretty much going to be the same exact layout and all the other features of the current $700,000 homes in Covina? Or is there going to be <coughs> magically, magically, a $700,000 home that finally has a different layout? <clears throat> well, gosh, I'm looking for $700,000 in Covina, three bedrooms, two bathrooms. They kind of all have the same layout, same kind of house. Yeah. And if 10 more come up on $700,000 in Covina, they're going to keep having the same layout, same look to it. There's not going to be one magical unicorn one that goes, oh my gosh, this is the one. This is the one that this is the layout. It's totally different than all the other ones. No, because then it would be a million dollars. But that's what buyers think to Eddie's point. It's such a great question he brought up. They think that well, when the, there's going to be one that's totally different than all the others. No, they're not. They're all pretty much the same in that price range in that city. If you want to go to a different price range or a different city, maybe you find something different. But that's that. Ayana, what was your question? Um, that was a great point of how you could tie down the buyer in regards to like the city. Mm -hmm. But um. I feel like I teach one that with this particular buyer. Like I feel like I tie her down with okay, right, let's yeah. choose you yeah. chosen this city. But then she'll come back. But if this comes up, then I'll I'm open to that. Same same with the uh, square footage or a one bedroom. You know, we we tie it down that she wants a two bedroom, but of course a one bedroom, six hundred square feet comes up. I, you know, make the call, talk to the agent, all that fun stuff just for her to be like, no. And I'm just like, really? <laughs> that and, and that's why. To, so so great question. That's why we have to do a, a box in and also with the consultation, figure out what are your minimum and maximum bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage? Well, I'm open to this. I, OK, great. So you're open to one bedrooms, two bathrooms, this square footage, so on and so forth. OK, great. What's most ideal? Well, I want two bedrooms. All right. So if I found you a one bedroom for 600, with 600 square feet, would you be open to it? No. Okay, great. Then I'm not going to do it. Or if they say yes, and then I go make that phone call and then they say, no, I'm not interested. 
that's when I need to have a conversation with them. This is a reevaluation conversation. Okay, great. I need to spend 15 minutes of your time. We need to reevaluate your search because what I've told you before, what, what we've had the conversations we've had before don't seem to fit what you like in reality. I want to, so let's go over that. So, you know, and then I would have a conversation. Now you said you might be open to one bedrooms, but I found you one, you didn't want it, right? Okay, so are we clear that we're just going to eliminate one bedrooms? Yeah, okay. And I'll just walk through that conversation. Otherwise, what they're going to do is they'll just keep stringing you along. Yeah. Okay. So have a re so, so just call them up and say, Hey, look, I need 15 minutes of your time. We just, I want to reevaluate your home search just to make sure that what you want and what's out there were lined up. Okay. Right. And then just have a conversation. And then I would just go over it. Now, originally you said you might be open to this, but based on our recent searches, it seems like you're not really open to the one bedroom. Is that right? Right. Okay, great. So let's just eliminate that. And then just go back to now, now that you've seen these homes, is, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? And then just mm -hmm. have that reevaluation with them. Okay. Thank you. And if, if you do that and they still like, well, I don't know, I'm still open to this. I'm still open to that. I, I then I would just, then I would just, this is where I would have the, as our they would say that come to Jesus moment where I would look at them and say, we, we've got to narrow down what you want. Right. Okay. We got to narrow down what you want. It, it's what I don't want to hear what you're open for. What do you want? Okay. Yes. Okay. I'll be having that conversation today. There you go. Um, okay. I do want to ask also, I mean, what is it? The interest rates have gone up. Mm -hmm. And so of course, buyers are not approved for the same amount. Mm -hmm. So what, how would you approach that conversation when they're sending the, the properties that they were approved for, <laughs> you know, and they're no longer approved that amount. Okay, great. So this is very simple. I appreciate you sending me this home. Can you go talk to your lender to see if you qualify for it? They come back and they, because I can't tell them that they don't qualify for it. I'm going to let the lender be the bad guy because otherwise then they think you're not helping them. Yeah. I appreciate you sending me that. Can you just go get an updated pre-approval letter from your lender? They come back and they say, well, my lender says now I only qualify for this. Okay, great. So now let's redo your search. Okay. Yeah. Let the lender be the bad guy, but don't show them property. Well, no, no, but I, I was pre-approved. That pre-approval was six months ago. I can't get, I can't even get you into that property with a six month pre-approval letter. I need a new one. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, let the lender be the bad guy. Mm. And, then, and then you get to be the hero to show them the price range they do qualify for. Right. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Last questions. Then we'll wrap up here. Chris says, how do you tell an SOI or past client you want to let someone else help them buy? So <laughs> depends. If it's, if it's out of my area, it's easy. I would just simply say, Hey, look, Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, you know, you're looking to buy in Arcadia. I don't really know that area very well. So to service you the best, I'm going to have my buddy Tyrone help you out. And so he can show you the right places. Is that okay? And then they'll just appreciate that you're helping them out. If it's in your marketplace, then what you just do, you could, if they're looking for a type of property, if they're looking for a condo, you know what, be honest with you, I've never really helped a client buy a condo in this particular area. So I'm going to refer you over to someone that has a little more experience dealing with HOAs. Okay. If it's, if it is an area that you've worked and you've closed before the type of property the best thing you can do then is just simply use the time. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, you know, I'm a little, I'm a little tied up right now with, you know, just some, some other deals I got going on. And I, I just don't, I want to make sure you get the best service possible. So for this particular transaction, I'm going to bring in one of my partners and they're going to help you out with this, with this deal. Okay. Cause I just, I want to make sure you're getting the best service possible. That's how I would try to handle that. Now, you're going to say that and you're probably, they're probably never going to use you ever again, but at least you're going to leave amicably and you, you give yourself a chance for deals down the line. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you, sir. That was a great question. Good questions. Everybody had great questions. I love it. All right. But as a true expression,